Welcome to The Real Deal, where it's all about businesses in central Massachusetts and northeastern Connecticut. And now, your host, Anthony Shabbat of Shabbat & Associates. Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Real Deal Business Podcast. My name is Anthony Shabbat with Shabbat & Associates Real Estate Group of Keller Williams. And on today's show, we have a podcast that I've been looking forward to doing for quite a while because um, I've known our next guest for quite a while. Uh, I would say probably about 15 years or so, Tom and I have known each other. Uh, His name is Tom Mercier, and he has quite a story. He's got a lot of things to talk about. Um, So let's, Tom Mercier, what is, what is your, you're a motivational speaker, he yes. um, he took a bicycle journey across on a recumbent bicycle across the country. Right on a recumbent trike, a three wheel bicycle. A uh, three wheel bicycle. Uh, that's that's the. It's kind of like you're on a recliner laying down, and you're going down the street on a bicycle yep. with the with the little triangle flag on the top because you're so low to the ground, right? Yep. I, I um, was accused I was taking a, sl- a nap when I was going. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Tom has an interesting story because well, why don't you? Uh, Talk about the, the the big thing that happened that caused all of this, all of the the things after it to happen. Sure. Um, uh, actually, why don't you brief overview yourself, your contact information, and how people can get in contact with you if they want to. Okay. My name is Tom Mercier. Um, you can get hold of me on Facebook mm-hmm. or um, Gmail at Thomas J Mercier sixty two at Gmail. And my phone number is 860-428-6884. And I started out in carpentry. I started out in sawmills, actually, making the lumber. Okay. Learned how to actually get, I got certified for grading dimension lumber. That tells you what's wrong with every piece of wood. So I thought that's where I was going. And then family, it was a family business. And then from there, I went on to carpentry and fell in love with Finnish carpentry. And that's actually how we met, Tony. That's right. A few years later, yeah. I was self-employed at that point, and we did a kitchen together for you. That's right. So. Yeah, and you were excellent to work with. You were, you were excellent. Yeah, I, I have no uh, complaints. There's nothing that could have been done any better than the job that you did, Tom. I was always happy. That's why I always kept calling you back for more work. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, so we, I had bought a house in Putnam, Connecticut, um, back in 2003, uh, and Tom was the. Ins- we renovated the whole kitchen, and Tom did an um, impeccable job on that, and that's that's how we met. So, and but we kind of kept in touch over the years through a website, a TV commercial that I created for you yep. for, the, for the carpentry business, and then uh, we kind of lost touch for quite a while, and then what happened after that? And then I got out of working for myself. I actually went to one of the big box stores and realized that the commercial, that end of things, wasn't for me. But then I did realize I enjoyed helping people. Mm -hmm. And then I went to go back on my own. And in 2013, I was snow blowing my driveway on my property. And a state plow truck operator lost control of his vehicle, came in my driveway and ran me over. I didn't see him coming. I ended up underneath the truck looking at the oil pan. My arm was my left arm was straight out, and I when I came to, I looked up and I said, "What the heck am I doing here?" And one of the jobs I had was maintenance crew for a trucking company, and his trucks were immaculate. It's Alan Rawson here in Putnam, and the first thing I thought of is, "Wow, guys, this thing is clean," because I was underneath <laughs> the truck and going to have to work on it. And then I realized, what am I doing here? Oh, so you didn't even remember why you were there. Like, no. what just happened? Right. You just completely was... knocked out unconscious, and you woke up, and you are under a truck. Right. Wow. So then I looked around, and I looked to my left, and I saw the tire of the truck right there, and my arm ended. Whoa. So I knew my, t- my arm was underneath the tire. Mm. So then I just started looking around, and being the logistical person I was, I tried to figure out what he had to do to get off of me. And then I just started yelling. And later I found out he told my wife that he had to climb back in the truck, start it up, and back off me. Oh, wow. So I know he's not having a good time either. I mean, mm-hmm. he didn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to go run this guy over. Right. So he lost control. See, I didn't know that part. I thought that he somehow didn't see you or something, no? No. 
Now, in fact, that's one thing my lawyer asked me right away. He says, are you sure you weren't on the road? Because they have the right of way on the road. Mm. And I says, no, we actually have pictures. It was the DOT full dump truck with the plow, and we got a picture of it. The whole thing is in my driveway. So he lost control of the dump truck yep. and hit you in your own driveway, plowing your driveway. So right. if you're out there plowing your driveway, uh, please be careful because this is um, obviously... You right, know, you don't want to be in that position. So, right. So, what happened after that time? Then I had about six months of recovery, and I was left hand dominant before. And with the six months of recovery, I had open wounds, and then I finally started to get healing. And I was so an avid cyclist before this. So you were a lefty, yeah, and, and you lost your left hand. Right. Basically, the use of your left left hand because now it doesn't work the way that it used to work. Correct. Because it was correct squished by a truck right tire. right and that's been a challenge too because <clears throat> i'm not 20 years old and being that i am 56 now when it happened i was 52 and man you, i can't even imagine you have to, to retrain yeah. yourself and like i said i don't have the hand but i physically have the hand Hmm. in the arm you do. but I can't use it right and when I do I pay for it dramatically with pain I have oh, pain okay. all the time but especially when I use it so I'm, I'm teaching myself how to do things again and that's where I'm going with life and what I'm working on on my next venture and one of my specialists told me early on he says Tom he says you know you're gonna have to really learn all over again or have to learn Mm -hmm. again yeah. and I just looked at him for a second didn't say anything and then I says I thought I was doing that already and then he says what and I says we learn until the day we die so it's just more of a challenge or a different challenge for me mm -hmm. yeah and then he says wow and then my wife also realized that I was an avid cyclist before and that I still had this one dream that I wanted to do and she says, well, what is that? I says, I've always wanted to bicycle across the country. And she says, are you nuts? You just got run over by a truck. <laughs> and I says, well, yeah. what's the chance of it happening again? Right. But again, <laughs> I don't assume nobody sees me. I make sure to go out there because you can be unsafe riding a bike or you can be safe. And I make sure to have the flags and the lights so I don't assume that I'm not going to get hit. Mm -hmm. I pretend that you know nobody sees me. Right. And then in 2016, I did stop my journey. I went from the East Coast to the West Coast, put my tire in the water in Musquamacate Beach. And again, my wife says, why do you have to start at Musquamacate Beach? Why can't you start here in Connecticut? We're so close to the coast. I says, because I'm going to do this, I'm going to put my wheel in the water on the East Coast, and then same thing on the West Coast. Awesome. Yeah, good for you. So that's what we did. That's fun. I mean, that's that's really visual, and you can people can, that must have been quite an experience, like the start, you're like, am I really doing this? It you was. Know, that moment, right? It was. And the, the two weeks leading up to it, I think, was the toughest for me, because I was training before that. I got all my gear. I was putting it on a bike. I was riding for a season and a half on that bicycle to get used to it and get used to the weight so I was ready to do this and then the last two weeks was too much logistical stuff I couldn't really get on the bike so it was actually a relief as soon as the day came I said oh I can finally start riding mm -hmm. yeah. so then I did and it took me three months three months to go from Musquamaki Beach to what was the to beach on the west coast Santa Monica Pier nice yeah <laughs> good choice yeah and I went down our coast to Virginia and then I started heading west Whoa. until I hit the old Route 66, and wow. then I took that in. So you did not even take the easy route? No. Wow. No. I didn't go over the Rockies. I could have went way over the Rockies, but I went down to the bottom of the Rockies because I'd taken 66, so I really missed a lot of that, which was okay with me. So I don't know anything about, I mean, the, the legendary Route 66. So what does it start in um, Virginia? Is that no, what you said? No, it starts in... Um, I don't even know where it starts now, but I know it's it's the middle of the country it starts and it okay. comes down. So I I ran into it about mid mid country mm -hmm. and almost midway on 66. Oh, so okay. My whole journey was 3,850 miles. Wow, man, that is crazy. And I dehydrated food for about six months before I left, so I had my meals with me, had a tent, had about 40 pounds of gear at all time with me, 
and I had my wife for a support vehicle, which ended up more work keeping the vehicle on the road than it was my bicycle. She broke down about three times. One time she had a friend come get me. I was about a day and a half out by bicycle at that point. So we had to go back to Pennsylvania, buy another RV, and then she brought me back to where I started, wow. where I stopped, and then we took off again. So how do you even begin a plan, plan a trip like that, you know? How did, how did you start? What did you do? What was the first? Did you, was, did you have any advice for somebody that's planning a trip like that? Um, yeah, um, definitely talk to people and, and find out, because there are people out there, like myself, that have done it. Um, I talked to a local bike shop that he had done it, and talked to a guy that I had worked with before that had done it in the past, and they said that they loved it. And, Who was the bike shop guy, just out of curiosity? Um, Donnie D? Don, Donnie D, yes. Yeah, yep. I mean, I talked to Donnie about that trip, actually. Yeah. He's got a book, I, and you have a book, actually, I think, right? That we're going to get into that soon? Yeah, well, I, I have a lot of notes, yeah. I haven't put it into a book. A few oh, people haven't? tell me I should put it into a book form, though. Yeah, in fact, one thing that Donnie told me, he says, come and talk to me anytime you want. He says, I'll help you keep my number when you're going across. He says, but one thing you want to do is don't carry a lot of water. I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? He says, think of how much water weighs. Oh, yeah. That's what, seven pounds a gallon? And you can pick up water pretty easily, right? Exactly. Wherever you want. Exactly. And that's what he pointed out. He says, how often do you go buy an extra mod or, you know, one of those convenience stores? And I said, true. He says, until you get in the desert, then you have to. Mm. And when I got in the desert, or even before that, I had the camel pack, so I had the water bladder with me. And my brother actually got me a water cooling vest to wear. You put it in a freezer at night, and then it's it's an ice vest that you wear to get through the desert, and it really works. Hmm. So, um, you and I met doing kitchen remodeling, basically, and then we lost touch with each other, and then you had the accident after different career changes, and then you, after the accident, how long did it take until you were ready to do anything after that? Was it months? Yeah, it was six it was months. a good six months before I was really up and and confident that I could. And even during those six months, I wasn't going to fall into the um, narcotics and alcohol, which I very well could have. I could have done the the poor me card, right. but I just yeah. wasn't. And I'm sure you had more than your share of opportunities. To yeah, try to uh, you know yep. to fall into that. Yeah, it was. Coming towards the end of my my wounds being open, my wife came home and I told her, I said, I just don't want to do this anymore. And she said, what? I says, the pain. I said, I can't get away from it. And she says, well, I don't know what to do. And I says, I don't either, because I'm not going to do anything about it, but there isn't anything I can do about it. And to this day, I still have pain. On a good day, it's a five on average. Wow. So I just learned to deal with it, and I'm doing... The stuff like um, Fred Merkel was just talking about on his podcast, you know, doing all the natural ways of dealing with pain. Have you found anything that seems to help you more than uh, anything else? Um, not really, just mind over matter, I guess, where you just determine that I'm not going to let it you know, stop me. You know, um, it's just, like I said before, learning all over again. And being left-hand dominant, I was finding that I was going outside and trying to do stuff, and I was using my hand too much. So then, well, I'm wearing a pair of gloves, so instead I took the glove off and put the glove in my left hand. So then I couldn't do something with my left hand. It forced me to do it with my right. Mm -hmm. So you just figure out different ways, and there's, there's always a way to do it. And that's what I'm working towards. And after the accident, I did go back to work for a little while, and I was a woodworking job coach for people with physical and mental disabilities. And I really loved it, but it was just too much on me physically. I couldn't do that much. They were really good about it. They wanted me to stay on or come back after my journey. And I also realized then that I wanted this next phase of my life, even more so than on my journey. When I was helping one of the clients, we had a rain day, and all the other job coaches were in the, in the wood shop. And there was one of the coach's students was sitting there, and he was getting ready to do his portion. So I looked at his coach, and I says, can I do this with him? He says, yeah, well, you got to do hand over hand. I said, well, I was going to anyway. 
So we do the hand over hand and he runs the nailer and he puts the nail into the board and he jumps right up, a quick stand up. And this is a large person. He's 6'3", probably 230 pounds. And his coach starts coming over in a hurry. I says, it's okay, it's okay. And then he says, what? I says, he's just excited. And he looks at this person, looks at me with a big smile on his face again. Absolutely, he do it again. He was just loving it. And I realized I just loved that, pay it forward, and life isn't that bad no matter what. Well, one thing I can say about you, Tom, that I've always appreciated is that you have this really gentle way about you. And it's like this, um, when I have a conversation with you, you are so calming to talk to. You're a very com- comforting type of person. You're easy to talk to, and you're sincere, genuine, just a naturally like a good guy you want to talk to you you're the type of person that you just want to be around you want to have a conversation with because you just get a good feeling when you talk to you you've always had that way about you so um i've always enjoyed um communicating with you over the years and um i'm sure that now that's probably part of the appeal why people want to hire you to be a motivational speaker um because you're you have that kind of personality and in you're you're a genuinely nice person, caring person, and you're you have this way about you. I don't know how how else to describe it, but it's a very positive way. Thank you, thank you. So uh, can we get into the um, you you had the accident, you did the bike journey across the country, and then what happened after that? I don't know if we uh, do we get into what happened after that. You went you went you started doing this working again with uh, yeah. the people that have challenges with uh, mental disabilities and that kind of thing? physical and mental disabilities, yeah. Okay, and then what happened after that? And then that's when I was working on doing my journey across the country, and between that and the job was just too much demanding on me. The company says that they were really pleased with what I did and everything, and they, you know, understand if I couldn't come back, but the door is always open for me there. And just like we're talking now, I realized that, I have something to say and I've always been that way but didn't realize it years ago I started helping out American Cancer Society by walking into their relay as they were setting it up and said you know I don't know what I can do but I just want to be behind the scenes not say anything and just help out so I started out moving tables and then six years or eight years later I stepped down from being logistic chair where I was head of the whole logistics committee of 40 people and realized that I really enjoyed helping those people, guiding those people, you know. And before the accident, I would go with my wife to different social events and family gatherings. And then I would say, okay, it's time to go, you ready? And I'd have to find her three or four times. And now we go to places and she's ready to go and waiting for me because I won't shut up. (laughs) Well, it's great to be back in touch with you again. It is. Uh, so what's the, what do you think the next step is, or what are you currently working on? What, what else has happened ever, ever since all that's transpired? Um, because I like to talk so much now and realize that I do and have what I think is something to tell people and realize that I want to share my message. I want to be a motivational, or I am a motivational speaker for youth. So I'm going into the schools and the 4-H camps and that type of thing. So... So um, what is your message that you, that you have to put out there, basically, to, to everybody? That um, What is the reason that the schools are contacting you for? Uh, what is it that they see in you that they can try to teach their, to their students? Um, there's a, a big thing with bullying, because bullying is a big problem, and it even starts in the elementary schools. It's not just the high schools. I mean, when the kids are out on the playground, oh, yeah. you know, and there's three or four kids, and then there's one kid that's taking control of the situation. Kids think that they're tattling. They're not tattling when they're telling the teacher that they told this student four times, don't push me or don't, don't take the swing away from me. You know, that's, that's a bully right at the beginning. And it's, it's what the kids see. And we can't blame them for the upbringing that they have. You know, some parents aren't, don't have the time because they have to work because now two people in the household have to work. 
-hmm. So life is different. We don't blame them for that, but we just want to be there to help them and let them know that they're not alone raising these kids. And I'm not going to go in and say, you know, don't do drugs. Yes, I am going to say that, but not going to get into that. They know enough not to do drugs. So that's not going to be my issue. My issue is, and my story is going to be, you know, let's get up off the couch, out from behind the computer, let's play ball, let's ride a bicycle. I mean, that's what I do when I get stressed or whatever. Everybody's got a bicycle. You know, find out what your bicycle is and get on it. So even the message, I, it seems to be that even through adversity, even though, you know, you lost the use of your left hand, basically, and you were left-handed, that you were still able to accomplish your goal of riding a bicycle across the country and life goes on and you, and you move on and you make the best of the situation and you're still a positive person and you're still a happy person and you just make the best of it, right? You just keep chugging along and, and you do everything that you can. Make yourself happy, make other people happy, and be a good person, contribute to society. Right, right. So um, people, you actually go to schools and, and they, um, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, can you give your contact information one more time? Sure. Um, I have a Facebook page. It's just my name, Tom Mercier. How do you spell it? Um, M-E-R-C-I-E-R. -E okay. I mean, I know. But yep. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and then what's, and the e what's the phone number and the email address again? My phone number is 860-428-6884. And my email is thomas.j.mercier. That's M-E-R-C-I-E-R -E -E 62 at gmail.com. Okay, so um, <clears throat> now say um, I'm a principal of a school or I'm the person in charge of school events or I don't, I don't know what the different school titles are, honestly, but if somebody from Killingly, Woodstock, Brooklyn, Pomfret, Thompson, Plainfield, Sterling, you know, wanted to get in touch with you and wanted to book you for their school, um, is that something that's possible? Absolutely, absolutely. And right now... My fee is going to be very low. What I'm looking for is for you to give me feedback that I can put out there to help grow my speaking. So you're going to put your services out there to these different areas if, if uh, they'd be interested in working with you, and then you can just have a – how does it work? Do you, when you go to the schools, what happens? What's the process? You, you make an appointment with somebody at the school, and then they have you come in and, and make a speech in front of the whole school, or was it like per classroom, or how does that work? Um, so far, it's leaning towards different groups of classes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have like an 80-minute block usually that I'll do. So, so you be a special guest that yeah. comes into a classroom, yep. talks to 20, 30 kids at a time, yep. and tells them, tells them your story. Right. And uh, you're a positive influence and uh, just kind of a, a fun thing for people to learn about. Yep. And I can even, especially locally to start out, I can go earlier in the day and spend the day with the students, go have lunch with them, you know, and get to know them, you know, find out about the game yesterday, and, you know, so we can talk about that. And well, I think that's an excellent thing for you to do, and it's, it sounds like a great contribution to society, especially so, so the younger kids in general, would you say it's elementary school type of kids typically, or? It's both. It's elementary and high school. High when school I, too, okay. When I first started, I was leaning towards high school, and then I realized that the problem isn't just high school. It's all throughout. And then I'm also going to be bringing another aspect into the whole speaking thing with my wife can be part of the package, too, mm -hmm. at a different um, rate that she's a EFT practitioner, which is another thing is called tapping. It's emotional freedom technique. Right. Yeah. And that's I'm something that, that yeah. yeah, it's similar to acupuncture, kids. but exactly. instead of the needles, it's just you're tapping and you're tapping into the meridian system. I've learned this from Brad and Pamela Thompson with right, the podcast. Right. I'm learning so much because of you, Tiana. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much for introducing me to all these people. It's been, it's been a great learning experience for me. Yeah. So you guys can actually go around together and uh, Tiana can take on one classroom or something and you can take on another classroom and they can uh, have a couple classrooms that are getting information and learning and fun. Right. Positive influence. Right. And I have different packages, too, what, what they want. If they want to have just myself come or if they want to have my wife and I come. And if it's farther, then it's the whatever the fee is at that time for that 
that event that we're doing for them plus expenses to get there because I mean I have no problem going to Texas if somebody wants me to but right. there is going to be a flight involved and stuff like that right yeah yeah that, that sounds like fun actually and it seems like the kind of thing that over time you can have a message like a like a kind of a tour and on this tour you're going to specialize in one subject or one message and on the and you learn a lot from that and then you can kind of build on that and then maybe there's another need that's out there that you can learn about and be kind of an expert on and help people work through and that kind of thing so it sounds right. like a pretty interesting it sounds like a fun thing to do actually and you're having a, a good time and you're helping people at the same time yeah yeah so that's great yeah. Well, um, so is there anything else that we should talk about, Tom? Is there anything, uh, you know, other information that you wanted to get out to the public in general? or? I don't think so, other than that I'm ready and willing and, and anxious to, to keep to get helping started. the schools out and the students out. And every school is going to have a different situation, like you were just saying. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's part of the reason for going there earlier than just the 90-minute block. I see what you're saying, yeah. So maybe you can fine uh, tune the message a little bit, but even per school, if they Correct. want to, if they want to get out a certain message Correct. to their students, then um, yeah, you can adjust it as needed yep. a little bit there. So it's pretty interesting. I like it. Thanks. And uh, so you'd encourage anybody to contact you and and try Absolutely. to you know take it from there. Just starts with a phone call. Absolutely. So and uh, don't be afraid of the geographical. You know where I am, where you are. Right, yeah. We'll get that figured out. I threw in the northeastern Connecticut thing because that's. You know, I'm always around this area, and yep. I can just blurt out those school names. But, uh, you know, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, California, Hawaii, Florida, you name yep. it, Texas, yep. Chicago. Uh, you just go all over the country, right? Yep. So, and I'll even lean on some of my family members and save you some cost if it's somewhere that I have a family member. I have a family member out in California. I have one in Las Vegas. I have another one in Vermont. You know, so I have people will put me up, so it'll save money. So. I'll come knock on their door and say, hey, look, I'm going to talk to the school next door, so let me sleep on your couch. <laughs> I actually want to do something similar. Uh, I've been talking about it, and, I, and I, um, I'm just going to blurt it out there, but basically um, I want to move to Florida eventually. You know, so And my dad lives on uh, the west coast of Florida, and because I do real estate and I do real estate photography, I want, what I want to start doing is I want to start going down to Florida maybe once a month, once every other month, and seeing if I can book enough to just cover the trip and cover the flight and I can my dad said I'm welcome to stay with him while I'm down there so if I can find some work for drone videos virtual tours photography you know maybe get a listing that I can list for sale um, of a commercial or uh, residential listing down there I could do that kind of thing if I could go down there once a month or once every other month then I can eventually make the transition down there and start planting the seeds over the you know months and years and, and eventually I'll get more and more down there and I can actually transition down to Florida. Nice. And that reminded me when you said Florida, I actually have a spot in Florida already that I own just south of Daytona. Oh. So if you're in the <laughs> Daytona area in a school looking for me to come out there, I already got a place to stay so you're not going to have to pay for that. Great. Well, we, we'll have to work out a deal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to go down there and stay down there. I'm not so. going to go to the kitchen again though. <laughs> All Last right. time I did your kitchen, <laughs> I walked in, and it was an interior door with a hole cut in it on a pair of sawhorses with a oh, sink in it. That was the, and that was your kitchen. That was something <laughs> else. I still have the pictures of that. Yeah. That was something else. Uh, and when you were done, it was a beautiful, amazing Thank kitchen. You. Yeah, it was one of the nicest kitchens I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I've done some showroom kitchens, and, and that's, that's been hard, too. And it's actually easier now for me to do the speaking that I'm telling my. I used to tell myself, even just recently, that I'm a finished carpenter. No, I'm a motivational speaker that was a finished carpenter, mm -hmm. and it's been a lot easier for me. Uh, well, doesn't hurt that you're a great guy, and you're really easy to talk Thank to. Thank you, Tony. You, you have this personality that uh, you just you know makes you com comfortable just talking to you. Thank and, you. Uh, you've always given that vibe. It's a very positive uh, comforting vibe so um thank you so much for being on the podcast tom you're welcome. and thank uh, you for having me no problem anytime and you're welcome to come back and and keep keep everybody posted on your okay. progress and uh updates occasionally you know if you want to come back every you know a couple times a year and just let us know That'd be awesome I, I, I love i'm going to continue doing this because i learned so much from it and these are things that i um i wouldn't necessarily learn about or have the time to really look into but because i'm forced to do it it's like all right i'm going to do this for an hour and I'm going to learn about Reiki and tuning forks and the 
the yeah. singing bowls and you know you never know what the next topic's going to be but honestly it's pretty cool yeah. it's a lot of fun it is and it's uh it's there's well, a lot of life out there it opens up your mind to different ideas and experiences that you wouldn't have uh, taken advantage of otherwise so right. i really love the podcast so awesome. um well everybody thanks so much for listening to the podcast um that's been tom mercier and he gave his contact information for a motivational speaker and if any schools are interested in having Tom as a motivational speaker at your school, give him a call. He's a great guy, and I highly recommend him. So, uh, And also, on the same note, I'll close out the show with my usual promotion for real estate. My name is Anthony Shabbat with Shabbat and Associates Real Estate Group of Keller Williams. And if you are looking to buy or sell a home in northeastern Connecticut or central Massachusetts or Florida... Um, I could get my Florida license pretty easily. Uh, so uh, feel free to give me a call, 508-847-0902. And I would be happy to, what I like to say is um, get the works with Shabbat and Associates, which means um, you get the drone video, the virtual tour, the floor plan, the professional photography, and I do a single property website with every single listing. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call, 508-847-0902, Anthony Shabbat, Shabbat and Associates Real Estate Group of Keller Williams. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Real Deal Business Podcast, and be sure to tune in and check out all the other episodes that we've had. I think we're up to, this is going to be episode 19, I believe. And um, then there's another podcast, the Real Deal Real Estate Podcast, which is all about real estate professionals. And I believe we're up to, I think... Right around the same number on that one, too. So we're right on like 30-ish podcasts total. Awesome. All kinds of stuff to listen to, all kinds of subjects. And the business version of it brings up uh, quite a variety of businesses where the real estate one is basically just uh, real estate agents and mortgage brokers and inspectors and appraisers and uh, you know that type of thing. Uh, but I would love to have more real estate related people on the show as well. It's been strictly business for, for I think the last couple, the last five or six podcasts have been all business. So I'd love to have some more real estate related people on the show. If you're a real estate photographer, if you're a drone pilot like myself, if you do virtual tours, if you're a realtor, don't feel like I'm not going to have you on the podcast just because you're a competitor of mine, because honestly, I don't really see the world that way. And I invite anybody that's even in my exact same field, um, to come on the show and we can talk shop so uh thanks so much for everybody uh for listening to the show and we'll see you next time have a great day